Now, what would Earth look like if it was the only planet in the solar system? Or, what would happen to our planet if the moon went missing? Or, what if dinosaurs had never gone extinct? We've all heard the story. Over 66 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Earth. Almost 75% of creatures that roamed the planet at the time were wiped out in mass extinction. Among them, dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, all gone. But because of that, we're all alive. According to science, the human race was developing more safely without these gigantic creatures hunting us. But what if that asteroid had crashed to the ground a few miles away from the place where it fell? What would the world be like today? Imagine walking down the street to your local supermarket and coming across a truck-sized T-Rex. Could that ever happen in this alternate universe we're talking about? Well, dinosaurs would have had to survive a lot more than an asteroid to be living nowadays. About 55 million years ago, the temperatures on the planet rose. The climate became 14 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. Rainforests flourished, and vegetation was abundant. In this scenario, herbivore dinosaurs would have likely thrived. But they would have started to look a bit different. Plants started growing during that time period were not very rich in nutrients. This means that dinosaurs would have probably shrunk in size, not having the necessary energy to grow all the way to their full size. Then, about 34 million years ago, South America and Antarctica split, which resulted in a cooler and drier climate. During this period, long-legged dinosaurs would have been the ones to survive. At that time, animals had to travel long distances to hunt, since seasons started to affect the availability of food and water. Compared to the mammals of that period, dinosaurs would have had significant advantages, like having more teeth or better eyesight. And speaking of mammals, some of them probably would have never evolved. That would have become dinosaurs' breakfast first. By the way, did you know that some dinosaurs live among us today? Think pigeons, or birds in general. They've all evolved from dinosaurs. Now I bet you've heard once or twice that we use 10% of our brains. If this was true, what would happen if you used 100% of our brain? Would you be able to compose a symphony? Would you become a tech genius and create a multi-million dollar company overnight? Let's start with the facts. We don't only use 10% of our brain. This notion became highly popularized by movies, but it's not very accurate. The truth is, the largest portion of your brain is active at all times. But not all parts are working simultaneously. The exact percentage varies from person to person. Now, neurologists say you wouldn't be using 100% of your brain's capacity at once. Your body simply wouldn't have enough energy for that, which means you'd be hungry all the time. Imagine the number of calories you'd need to consume for that to work. You would also be limited by your body's basic needs, breathing, digesting food, and circulating blood. So if you did use all of the capacity of your brain, you'd be tired all the time. It'd be worse than running a marathon without any preparation. The brain would need all the blood you'd have, which would mean less oxygen for your lungs. Different organs would begin to shut down one by one. In a nutshell, it'd be terrible for your health. By the way, some researchers have estimated that more than 60% of the brain is composed of something that is called neural dark matter. In other words, this dark matter consists of neurons that have no apparent purpose or simply don't respond to common stimuli. Marathons are some of the greatest feats of strength and endurance in the world. But what would happen to your body if you decided to run a marathon without any training? The statistics are overwhelming. Nearly 50% of participants drop out of the race before crossing the finish line. A regular marathon is 26 miles long. And if you're not used to physical activity, it's a great challenge. You'd probably be able to run the first mile without any serious problems, but breathing loudly and heavily through your mouth. By the third mile, your body temperature would skyrocket, and you'd feel as if you have a mild fever. You'd most likely give up here, but if you decided to keep going, you'd have to trick your mind and body into running another 23 miles. By the 20th mile, you'd hit what is known as the wall. 
your body would have burned all your reserves of glucose and you'd get extremely tired. Even experienced runners often go through this stage. By the end of the marathon, you'd be promising yourself to never do this again. You'd leave the race with at least a few cramps and many food cravings. Now picture this, it's a clear, beautiful night. There are no clouds and you can see two of the brightest planets in Earth's sky blinking up there. Those are Mars and Venus. Now have you ever imagined what would happen if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? If the other planets never existed, things would be really different for our Earth. The planets in the solar system work together, keeping one another in certain place with their gravitational pull. Now, if Mercury or Venus ceased to exist, Earth would drift closer to the Sun. Our atmospheric temperature would become similar to that on the surface of Mercury, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This would make life on Earth impossible. But if Jupiter or Saturn disappeared, Earth would most likely drift further away from the Sun, and its temperature would drop to below negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If life managed to survive in such circumstances, it would probably be aquatic. The position of Earth in the solar system not only affects all kinds of life forms, but it also dictates seasons, the length of days, and how long one year lasts. Now, when we say no other planets, we mean no moons either. So, what would happen if one fine day, the moon just disappeared? That would have catastrophic consequences. The moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. In a moonless universe, tides would shrink by about 75%. This would greatly affect crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones. This would consequently disrupt the diet of larger animals. Eventually, it would affect entire coastal ecosystems. Earth's weather would change. Tides and tidal currents help mix cold Arctic water with warmer water from the tropics, stabilizing the climate worldwide. Weather forecasting would become almost impossible, and the average difference between the hottest and coldest places on Earth would become extreme. The absence of the moon would also influence Earth's tilt. Right now, Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees, mostly due to the moon's gravity. With no moon around, Earth's axis would wobble between 10 to 45 degrees. Scientists believe that even a slight difference in Earth tilt can cause huge changes, such as an ice age. Other than this, a moonless sky would upend the lives of many nocturnal animals. Moths have evolved to navigate using the light of the moon and stars. Newborn baby turtles use the moon's light to find their way to the ocean. Different animals rely on both darkness and a small amount of moonlight to hunt effectively. Now how about we travel far back in time and imagine what would happen if you lived in ancient Egypt. This civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians were responsible for building some of the world's most recognizable symbols, the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you'd lived in ancient Egypt, you'd have witnessed a time of enormous scientific and mathematical breakthroughs. Ancient Egyptians organized themselves in strict social structures, so you'd probably have to fit into one of them. You'd have either been born a laborer, a farmer, or a specialist, which was either a soldier, a sailor, or a teacher. Or you'd have been part of the Egyptian elite. If you had been a farmer, you'd probably live in a house made of mud bricks. You'd have had a stone oven and kept your food stored in a pit in the ground. You'd have spent your days tending to crop fields by the Nile River, or taking care of cattle and ducks. On tax days, you'd have packed up some of your harvest and brought it to the temple as payment for the usage of land. If you'd been a member of the elite, you'd have spent most of your days in banquets. You would have adorned yourself in gold and semi-precious stones, displaying all your wealth. If you had lived in ancient Egypt, maybe you would have been one of those who invented tables. Yep, before the Egyptians, there was no such thing as a table. This invention appeared as a way to keep food off the ground. Imagine stepping out of your spacecraft and setting foot on the surface of the moon. Under your feet, the ground is covered with a fine material that looks like powder. That's lunar dust. You look around and take a lungful of fresh air. It smells very different from the air on Earth, but still nice. 
Now, unfortunately, this is a highly unlikely scenario. And one of the reasons is that the Moon has almost no atmosphere. Earth's natural satellite is too small, less than 2% of our planet's mass. That's why it doesn't have a magnetic field strong enough to keep an atmosphere. But even if the Moon had it, solar winds would immediately pull it away. But if you could visit the Moon 3 or 4 billion years ago, oh, you'd see a very different picture. At that time, the Moon most likely had an atmosphere. It formed at the times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking the satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface. It happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine, ginormous plumes of magma hurling high into the air, falling to the ground, forming lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists on Earth got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggested the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles. Well, these days, it's around 240,000 miles. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. Hm, neither was I. At the same time, the most recent studies have confirmed that our Moon actually does have an atmosphere. It's composed mostly of hydrogen, neon, and argon, and contains some very unusual gases, like potassium and sodium. You can't find them in, let's say, the atmospheres of Mars, Venus, or Earth. Sadly, such an atmosphere isn't suitable for us oxygen-dependent creatures. But guess what? There's loads of oxygen on the Moon. Nah, I know, it must sound confusing. But the thing is, this oxygen isn't in its most common gaseous form. Nah, it's trapped in a layer of rock and dust covering the surface of the Moon. This layer is called the regolith, and it contains up to 45% oxygen. So, does it mean that if people learned how to extract this oxygen, we would be able to live on the Moon? Eh, not so fast. The oxygen in those rocks is very tightly bound into the minerals. And to break these components apart, we'd need tons of energy and special equipment. But if people managed to start this process, the Moon would deliver quite a lot of oxygen. Now, there's a theory that the Moon might have been formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller, the size of Mars. It probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory claims that the Moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet, and that's how the Moon appeared in the sky. And the least exciting theory claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. These days, the Moon is the fifth largest natural satellite in our solar system. It's also one of the densest, second only to Jupiter's satellite Io. Most likely, the Moon has a tiny core, no bigger than 2% of the satellite's mass. About 420 miles wide, it consists mostly of iron and sulfur. The Moon's surface is dark, even though Earth's natural satellite is the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its reflectance is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might have heard that the Moon, along with the Sun, causes tides in the oceans and seas on Earth. The satellite's gravitational pull creates something called the tidal force. It makes the water bulge out on the sides that are the closest to the Moon and farthest from the satellite. These bulges are what we know as high tides. But what not so many people know is that the Moon also causes rocks to rise and fall, 
just like it does with water. Of course, this effect doesn't look as dramatic as ocean tides, but it's still noticeable. Earth's solid surface moves by an inch or so with each tide. Now, not only does the moon cause tides on our planet, but it also slows down its rotation. This phenomenon is known as tidal breaking. It increases the length of a day on Earth by a bit more than 2 milliseconds per 100 years. The moon is also moving away from Earth at the same rate at which your fingernails grow. That's about 1.5 inches per year. Um, you should really cut those. If one day it floats away into space, our planet will have to live through tough times. Without the stabilizing pull of the moon's gravity, Earth's tilt would start changing wildly, from no tilt at all, meaning no seasons, to a large tilt, resulting in extreme weather. Since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, nothing protects it from extreme temperatures. It gets incredibly cold on the night side, minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, the sunny side is literally boiling, with a temperature of 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing the moon can't protect itself from without an atmosphere is meteorites. That's why the surface of the satellite is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the moon, the number is so much greater – several million. And around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. The moon is less seismically active than Earth. That's why these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. But even though the moon's surface is mostly dormant, Earth's natural satellite still experiences moonquakes. They start several miles beneath the surface. One theory suggests that they may be happening because the moon is shrinking as its insides are cooling. Scientists say the moon has become around 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. So, how does it work? Well, picture a grape turning into a raisin. It wrinkles while shrinking. The same is happening to the moon. It's shrinking and it's wrinkling. But unlike a grape, the moon doesn't have any flexible skin. Its surface is hard and brittle. So as the moon gets smaller, the crust cracks and breaks. Its sections get pushed over neighboring parts. Researchers are sure that such faults are still active and likely responsible for the quakes shaking the moon. Some of these quakes are pretty strong, up to 5 on the Richter scale. When you look up at the moon, you always see the same side of Earth's natural satellite. Like our planet, the moon rotates around its axis. But this rotation lasts around 27 days. This is the same time the moon needs to orbit Earth. Such a phenomenon is called tidal locking. Before space exploration started, people had never seen the other face of the moon. They didn't know what the far side looked like. While the near side of the moon is mostly large plains covering impact basins, the far side is rugged and cratered. The crust is thicker there, with less evidence of volcanic activity. Oh, by the way, the moon isn't perfectly round or spherical. It's shaped like an egg. When you're looking at it, one of its small ends is always pointing at you. Yep, right at you. This is the reason why the moon's center of mass isn't its geometrical center. In reality, it's a bit more than one mile off-center. Like a poorly made golf ball. When you see it in the sky, it looks round, but the moon is more of an oval shape, similar to a lemon. This shape, flattened with a bulge on each side, came out billions of years ago when extremely hot tidal forces shaped its crust. They heated up some regions more than others. Gravity from our planet has helped to exaggerate this lemon shape over time. When they were getting ready to send missions to the moon, some researchers were worried because there was a thick layer of dust on the lunar surface. They were afraid seas of dust were both soft and thick enough to swallow their lunar lander. But even though the surface there is dusty, this layer is just too thin to cause complications. Our moon certainly isn't the biggest one in the solar system. The champion here is Ganymede, one of the 79 moons circling around Jupiter. But our moon is the largest in relation to its parent planet. It has a diameter of more than 2,000 miles, which is slightly bigger than the quarter of the size of the Earth. Pluto, for instance, has a smaller moon-to-planet ratio. Its biggest moon, Charon, is almost the size of Pluto. 
which is why it looks like a double dwarf planet system. How long would a walk around the moon take you? When the Apollo astronauts were there, they managed a walking speed of approximately 1.3 miles per hour. On average, you walk twice as fast down on Earth. The low gravitational force on the moon would give you significantly less traction on the ground, but those special spacesuits astronauts were wearing were never actually designed for long-distance hikes. In theory, you could maybe reach the speed of 3 miles per hour before you'd need to break into a run. At this pace, you travel 6,770 miles, which means making a circle around the moon in 91 days if you're walking non-stop. Why does the moon change its shape? It goes through different phases each month, starting from the new moon and gradually going to the full moon, just to do the same thing all over again, but in reverse. The sunlight hits one half of the moon at a time, this gives it a night and a day side, just like we have it here on Earth. The shape we see the moon in depends on where it's located compared to the sun. If it's directly between us and the sun, the sunlight only hits the side we don't see. That's a new moon. It appears completely dark in that phase. But when it comes to the far side of our planet from the sun, its day side completely faces the Earth. That's when we see a full moon. After the initial phase, when the moon is new, we'll see more of its surface in the sky as it orbits our planet. It's something we call waxing. The moon in this phase first becomes a crescent. The first quarter moon is when it's half full. After that, it goes into a gibbous moon phase, when it's larger than half full, but not yet full. After it reaches the full moon phase, it slowly shrinks and goes through the same phases but in the opposite direction. While up on the moon, you'd probably see human footprints there. True, no one has stepped there since the last Apollo mission in 1972. And the footsteps may stay there for many years because there's no geological activities on the moon, like earthquakes or volcanoes. There are no winds, rain, or other things that could erase these footprints. How would you get to the moon? Rockets are probably the first thing that comes to your mind. But a lunar elevator could be an even better solution because traveling in a rocket would be a difficult, expensive, and pretty dangerous way to try to reach the lunar surface. Why would people want to go there? It's not just about craters, an amazing view of our home planet, or other unique things the moon offers. It's also full of resources like a rare form of helium. Humans could use it in fusion power stations on Earth. We could extract some other rare elements too, and use them for smartphones and other gadgets. For a lunar elevator, we need to stretch a cable anchored to the moon's surface for 250,000 miles towards the Earth. We wouldn't be able to attach it directly to our planet because both Earth and the moon are moving. But we could terminate high in our planet's orbit. We'd have solar-powered robotic shuttles that would move up and down the cable. This is like having a conveyor belt to ferry rare and precious resources our way. The cable would be as thick as a pencil and would weigh 40 tons. It sounds expensive, but a lunar elevator would most likely pay for itself within only 53 trips. The moon is in constant motion. It rotates on its axis and circles around the Earth, and it makes the same amount of time for the moon to make a circle around the Earth and rotate once on its axis, compared to our planet, which rotates on its axis every 24 hours and makes a full circle around the sun in 365 days. So, the moon is tidally locked to our planet, which is why we always see the same side of the moon. One theory says the moon probably formed when a large Mars-sized object from our solar system hit the Earth. They collided 4.5 billion years ago when the solar system was still in its early stage, which was pretty chaotic. If this theory is correct, around 60% of the moon is made of lighter elements that are also present in the outer layer of our planet. A lucky set of circumstances lets us see total solar eclipses from our planet. The moon is the perfect size and distance from the Earth to appear the same size as the sun when we're looking at it in the sky. When the moon passes between the sun and us, it covers the sun perfectly. Plus, you can see an impressive halo that illuminates its edges. If it were any farther from us or smaller, 
a solar eclipse would only look like there's a blot on the sun. Our moon contains the water that kind of jumps around. There's water there locked up in ice. Some water molecules move around the surface as the moon cools and warms during the day. The water gets stuck on its surface until the lunar midday, when the sun is above the upper branch of any of the moon's meridians. At this point, some of the water melts, heats up, and ends up in the delicate lunar atmosphere. Its atmosphere generally contains some unusual gases, including potassium and sodium. Venus, Mars, and Earth don't have these in their atmospheres, so the water stays and floats there until it gets to a cooler area. Then it settles back to the surface. There's a specific anomaly under the surface of the south pole of the moon, a giant and extremely dense blob of metal lodged in the mantle. And most likely, it's altering the moon's gravitational field. No one knows how such a huge blob of metal ended up trapped under the lunar surface, it could perhaps be remnants of the iron-nickel asteroid. Four billion years ago, this asteroid crashed into the far side of the lunar surface and created this enormous South Pole Aitken crater. Our natural satellite is shrinking. Its interior is cooling, which results in the moon getting over 150 feet skinnier just as a grape wrinkles as it's shrinking down. But a grape has flexible skin and the lunar surface crust is brittle. That's why it breaks as the moon is getting smaller. That way, it forms thrust faults. One section of crust pushes over the closest part. This has been going on for the past few hundred million years. These lunar faults are still active. They probably produce moonquakes as the moon gradually shrinks and cools all the time. Some of these quakes are strong, maybe five on the Richter scale. During their orbit around the moon, astronauts took images of Ina, a quite unusual volcanic deposit. Ina is not that old. It might have been formed somewhere between 3.5 and 1 billion years ago. The volcanoes on the moon were probably active during the age of dinosaurs. If only they could have invented telescopes! They'd probably have a magnificent view of lava oozing from the lunar surface from time to time. The moon has its own time zone called Lunar Standard Time. It doesn't correspond with the time on our planet. A year on the moon lasts 12 days. Each day is about as long as a month on Earth. These days got their names after astronauts who walked on the moon. The days are divided into 30 cycles. The cycles are divided into hours, minutes, and seconds. The calendar started when Neil Armstrong set his foot on the moon on July 21, 1969.